Okay, so good morning to the DigiTalk community. Today, the authors of the study would like to present to you the reflections and lessons learned on teaching, learning, and assessments in a first year introductory course during the COVID-19 pandemic. When COVID-19 forced universities in 2020 to close the doors from face-to-face -face education and welcome an online hybrid approach, academics had to adjust all educational practices to ensure quality and proper education continued successfully. An introductory academic information course that deals mainly with computer literacy and has a cohort of over 9,000 students had to find ways to help bridge the digital divide using online digital technology. The issues with the internet connectivity, load shedding, and students not having compatible devices were just the start of many problems. Many students could cheat the online system because assessments were not set for online learning. This study discusses the strategies implemented and the lessons learned during the university shutdown in 2020 and the new approach in 2021. The AIM course was founded on the learning theory mentioned by Moharaj in 2020. The theories involved in this type of learning are behaviorism, cognitivism, and constructivism. According to this theory, the behaviorism theory determines behavior by external stimuli focusing on what the learner does. This type of learning focuses on basic definitions and explanations of topics and generalization and recollection. Cognitivism focuses on how students arrange the new information and how they process it. Higher order reasoning, information processing and memory are stressed in this type of learning. Constructivism describes a student's approach to learning new material and applying it to real world circumstances. This type of learning emphasizes problem solving and critical analysis focusing on real world scenarios. We improved the AIM course by embracing this theory, which allowed us to lead students toward better knowledge and eventually greater freedom in the learning process. Blackboard Learn is the learning management system that we use to allow students to view, download their content for each course they were registered for during the, their degree. As a result, the module in 2020 was designed with face-to-face -face interaction in mind. With the shift to an online hybrid approach, students struggled to learn the learning management system, leaving them perplexed and frustrated in their attempts to gain access to the content of the module. In 2021, to enforce the behaviorism theory for learning, we created a video showing them how to use Blackboard Learn to navigate the module. We also integrated the resources into Blackboard Learn by developing content areas that organize information according to the students' needs to increase their overall involvement. This navigation method made students feel in control of their learning material. The AIM content was based on a navigating information literacy section, their predominantly theory and practical component that required Microsoft Office. During the 2020 lockdown, students used the fifth edition of the NULL textbook, which was published in 2017. This textbook was designed as a single source of information containing fact-based knowledge where students assumed that learning was simply a collection of facts and figures. The textbook had all the answers to the questions which made students view learning as an accumulation of correct answers. In 2021, the sixth edition of the ebook was released. Students had access to various information sources, including websites, videos, and higher level of questions that encouraged creative thinking and problem solving. According to cognitivism, learning theory focuses on how information is received, organized, stored, and retrieved by the mind. 
Therefore, the new ebook helps students engage with the content and was not just a reference book. The theory of behaviorism and constructism also played a role in the development of interactive videos and resources. The platform used for disseminating the null content resides in Blackboard Learn. However, in 2020, the questions used for testing purposes were based on traditional exam questions used in the past. These questions also advance students towards surface learning, in which they memorize information without understanding them. The database of questions could also be found by searching on the web and in the textbook. In the textbook, it did not effectively engage students in lifelong learning. Cognitivism was enforced to assist students in exploring and exhibiting rigor in the application of knowledge and the null content questions were modified to higher order thinking questions. Even though a more extensive database of questions was created, it was designed so that the quality was prioritized over the quantity. The questions were now scenario based encouraging students to think outside the box and go beyond memorizing facts. The semester mark involved seven compulsory assignments in 2020. Each assignment was open for two weeks, allowing three attempts each and only the highest mark was taken from the three attempts. The module included two semester tests, which contributed 30% each towards the semester mark. In 2020, the continuous assessments were associated with deadlines. This showed that students' engagement only peaked a few times through the year, usually the days before the assessment deadline. In 2021, we allowed access to all the course content at the beginning of the semester, including 11 compulsory assignments. Behaviorism was enforced as if students missed the assignment deadline, no extensions were given because the assessments were open for long periods. To avoid cheating during the semester test, the large number of questions allowed for randomization. For the practical section, the projects were SAM, but SAM contained an auto grading feature that inspects for integrity violations. Even though the module had approximately 9,000 students no student could upload a file that belonged to someone else. Throughout the semester of 2021, the discussion board was used more effectively to answer all student questions. A discussion board was created with numerous threads on all issues that students frequently faced. Assistant lecturers were assigned to specific sessions daily to maintain this discussion board. We saw that when the semester assessments were due, students used the discussion board to query rather than emailing their lecturer, which lowered the tension and the anxiety for both the lecturer and the student. The discussion board proved more successful as it aligned with constructivism, where students use other students' posts to enhance their learning. Since online learning was new to us, Blackboard Collaborate sessions were made available from Monday to Friday in 2020. However, students did not have devices to attend classes and needed significant data fees, so attendance was limited. Some of the sessions did not fit into the students' timeline as they overlapped with other modules. In 2021, we created sessions from Monday to Saturday from 7 in the morning until half past 5. In this way, students could attend any session that suited their schedule. Weekly schedules were provided so that students could know when what was required of them beforehand. However, when lockdown began in 2020, schedules continued to change due to government and universities policies for COVID-19. Schedule changes contributed to extending assignment deadline. Students therefore did not consider the latest schedules and did not take responsibility for their learning as too many changes occurred over a short period. 
In the current times, the schedules were set beforehand. They were well adapted and all assignments opened at the beginning of the se semester. This was due to the course management deciding to remain online for the entire semester and relating to the concept of behaviorism. Many students did not have devices at the beginning of the lockdown period and the university had to make provision for a time-consuming delivery period for such students. These left students feeling frustrated and depressed as learning had to continue. And by the time the devices arrived, they missed some deadlines or Four just minutes. had too much work to catch up and complete. During the middle of the semester, all registered students could apply to loan a device from the university and approximately 2,000 loan devices were supplied to all those who qualified. Another big issue that we continue to confront is load shedding. A shortage of electricity causes poor to no connectivity, making it difficult for both assistant lecturers and students to participate in online learning. We could only address this by making all assessments available at the start of the semester, allowing students to complete the assignment before the deadline. This arrangement was also made to enforce behaviorism in which students were held accountable for their time management. In April 2020, the university officially launched the Connect Portal for students and staff to access their digital content and online assessments without any data charges. From the beginning of 2021, creating online content was a critical step. Voice over PowerPoint videos were made to go over the content and interact with the activities given. These videos, however, were not consistent with the chapters. The videos were too long and not very engaging. Assistant lecturers were not equipped with the correct tools for video creation. Therefore, audio was of poor quality. Looking at the learning theory of behaviorism, cognitivism, and constructivism, improvements in 2021, videos were made to allow self-guidance. The voiceovers were conducted by one person who had all the correct equipment. All video scripts were moderated through a series of moderation to ensure language, grammar, and content were of good standard. We discovered that incorporating the learning theory within the module transformed the online environment into a more resourceful and successful learning environment. Thank you. Uh, turning constraints into opportunities, that's wonderful. Online delivery of communication skills simulation sessions to undergraduate medical stu students during the COVID-19 pandemic. So over to you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Lorraine, for uh, uh, basically uh, inviting me for this particular presentation today. Uh, so as you mentioned, the title of my presentation is uh, turning constraints into opportunities, the online delivery of communication skills sessions to medical students during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm Dr. Rina Abraham and uh, my co-presenter is uh, Dr. Diantia Enoch. Uh, I coordinate the clinical skills program at the Nelson Mandela School of Medicine, University of KwaZulu-Natal in Durban, South Africa. So we start off with a short background. Uh, effective communication during consultations with patients and their families is an essential uh, skill for inst instilling confidence in the medical practitioner. The ability to communicate effectively is a core competency needed by a healthcare professional. Studies have found that patient-centered communication tends to enhance health benefits, patient experience, and perceived care quality. So what do we know of the delivery of communication skills training so far? The ability to communicate effectively is a core competency taught during the undergraduate medical curriculum. Communication skills training focuses on history taking related to a specific body system and follows the Calgary-Cambridge framework to a clinical consultation. Various methods are used to teach patient-centered communication skills to medical students. One of those methodologies includes simulation-based training in small groups. This training involves simulating a doctor-patient consultation as a role play using simulated patients. 
A simulated patient is a person trained to behave as a real patient to replicate a series of symptoms or problems. Simulation during a face-to-face -face encounter is traditionally taught in the clinical skills laboratory, which offers a safe and controlled environment, allowing for students to practice on simulated patients, receive feedback, and refine their communication skills. All that changed in March of 2020 with the nation lo nationwide lockdown and universities amongst other institutions had to close their training facilities. In response, medical education made a sudden, albeit unplanned leap into the world of online teaching as a sole pedagogy to replace traditional hands-on learning. This requires the clinical skills department at the Nelson Mandela School of Medicine to adapt and develop a structure for delivering communication skills training using an online platform while retaining the key principles and structure of the in-person face-to-face communication skills teaching. To deliver teaching remotely, UKZN opted to use Zoom as the institutional online platform. Zoom is a portal that allows hosts and participants to conduct real-time online meetings and webinars. It allows participants to see and hear each other using webcams and microphones on computers and smartphones. The pilot online communication skills simulation teaching session was integrated into the second year MBCHP cardiovascular system theme. Detailed case scenario scripts for the simulated patients and a cardiovascular history taking protocol for the students based on the Calgary Cambridge guidelines to assess the biomedical perspective, the background information, and the patient's perspective of their illness was developed. The objectives of the simulation session, the schedule and time allotment, and the history taking protocol as pre-reading material were shared with the students on the university's learning management system, Moodle. The participants for the project included the clinical skills laboratory tutors and second year medical students. The second year class have had more than a year of communication skills in-person simulation role play training previously. We tested various roles, including the roles of tutors as uh, facilitators, tutors as simulated patients, students involved in the role play as simulated students, and students involved in scenario observation and debriefing process. This figure provides a structural representation of the whole process and the communication channels during the simulation process. During the preparation, uh, sorry, uh, so this was the role of the tutors uh, uh, tested as facilitators, tutors as simulated patients, students involved in the role play as simulated students, and students involved in the scenario observation in the, uh, and the debriefing process. So during the preparation period, different channels were used to share information between the tutors, the training of the simulated patients for the role play, and the actual online simulation teaching session. Instruction was shared with the students on the expectations of either playing the role of simulated students or observers during the online simulation session, and that the virtual doctor-patient consultation would follow the conventional format. The actual choosing of simulated students was done during the online session. Students were informed of the need to turn on their video and unmute their microphone when requested to talk to the simulated patient. Each simulation group had one facilitator, one simulated patient, four simulated students, and 12 students observing the session. During the online simulation session, the tutors as simulated patient role played the patient, while the students as a simulated students role played the doctor. The simulated students established rapport and gathered information regarding the presenting problems from the simulated patient as in a doctor patient consultation with their microphones and videos turned on. The remaining students and facilitator observed the interaction and gave feedback. The remotely facilitated simulation was delivered in a similar manner as in the in-person facilitated simulation-based training, except that the facilitators, simulated patients and students interacted with each other via a monitor and speakers from an off-site location. 
So how did we schedule the communication skill simulation session to ensure effective use of the one hour Zoom session? As mentioned previously, preparatory material was shared with the students ahead of the session so that they were well prepared to interact with the simulated patient. On arrival at the session, welcome and pre-briefing by the facilitators that also included selecting the simulated patient or simulated students from the group. This was followed by the actual role play using a stable angina scenario between the simulated students and the simulated patient, while other students and facilitator observe. During the session, facilitator debriefing that included interactive feedback to the students on their communication style, their reasoning through the case, constructing differential diagnosis, and a medical summary was provided. All participants were actively included in the discussion during and after the scenario. At the end of the session, the link to the survey form was posted on Moodle for students to evaluate the pilot session in real time. So a summary of our pilot study, a dry run online teaching month gave us the opportunity to pilot the remote face-to-face -face simulation based communication skills training to the second year MBCHB class. The simulation process was evaluated immediately after the session through an online survey for real-time feedback from the participating students on the perceptions of the effectiveness of the online simulation-based communication skills training, as well as develop, uh, uh, understanding any gaps in this particular innovation and to fix those gaps uh, you know, before the actual formal teaching uh, program was instituted. So based on students' feedback, there were advantages and disadvantages to the online training platform. Students saw the merit in having aspects of communication skills taught online. Although they did not consider it as an ideal platform, they thought it was the best at this time of the pandemic to avoid a substantial loss of student learning time and saw the advantages of its ease of use as an additional user-friendly learning platform in the future. With previous exposure to immersive uh, in-person simulation, students were able to compare and perceive the usefulness of technology to facilitate learning, mentioning that the online simulation met the learning objectives of the communication skills training. Interestingly, apart from network connectivity issues, one of the challenges identified by students revealed that they had experienced a deeper understanding of concepts related to the skill. For example, a student commented that he or she could not see the hands and the body of the simulated patient through a video screen, which meant that this student appreciated the significance of picking up nonverbal cues in communication skills. Students were even aware of methods to rectify this flaw and mentioned that adjusting the camera angle of the actors during the role play could help to see hand gestures and facial expressions better. An important aspect of a good doctor-patient communication is active listening and demonstrating empathy. Students mentioned that listening attentively, demonstrating concern and care for the patient can be expressed through computer-mediated communication, thereby introducing the concept of digital empathy. Students perceived that their engagement during the sessions facilitated their relationship with their tutors. As one of the students mentioned, open quote, the tutor gave me feedback on what I missed out and, and reminded me not to show certain judgmental expressions. I felt like the tutor knows me and was just talking to me all the time. I'm also able to privately message the tutor just for real-time feedback on my doubts, close quote. Finally, though students were doing this for the first time, they all agreed that the facilitation of pre-briefing, scenario role play, and debriefing on an online platform was intense and with less distraction and effective. The Zoom chat facility allowed for providing peer feedback and for responding to questions on the case. They believe the online platform enhanced their understanding of the reasoning through cases and felt confident to apply the diagnostic clinical reasoning skills to other scenarios with more practice with their peers. Further, Four minutes. Further, the Zoom recordings made available had the advantage for re-watching or as catch-up accommodating to network connectivity issues. Watching the recordings also provided students with feedback 
has it helped with their reflection on and self-assessment of their performance? In conclusion, some of the take-home messages are, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on medical education required innovative solutions for delivering communication skills training that required retaining the key principles and structure of the in-person face-to-face -face communication skills teaching using an online platform. Clinical communication, online simulation is an important educational tool that promotes the development of communication and clinical reasoning skills in medical students. An important requirement for learner engagement with remotely facilitated simulation-based training is the development of contextual understanding, multiple exposures, and a respectful learner-teacher relationship. The study also demonstrates that remotely facilitated communication skills simulation-based teaching evokes a range of emotional, social, and cognitive responses in learners that can influence their attitudes towards acceptance of technology in learning. This potential influence is not limited to undergraduate medical education. With the increasing use of telehealth, especially during the current pandemic, online simulation could be incorporated into postgraduate medical training and nurse education programs to help health professionals reflect on and develop their communication skills. The inevitable transformation of medical education caused by COVID-19 is still ongoing as the safety of students and training of competent physicians are the responsibilities of medical schools, a consideration that cannot be ignored is how online simulation-based teaching and learning can be sustained after the pandemic. For this, for example, through extension learning or within a dedicated pedagogy such as blended learning. Finally, as medical educators, we should be designing educational models and testing the design of these models that will increase the digital communication skills of the next generation of healthcare providers. Thank you. Okay, so my talk for today is about the SWOT analysis of academics experiences and changing pedagogical practices in teaching a scientific academic literacy course online. And this work is done with my colleague, Dr. Vasanti Padiachi. Just a roadmap, uh, it's gonna cover a bit of the background, some of the methodology, and then the theoretical framing of the SWOT analysis, as well as some of the pedagogical changes that took place within the module and a few concluding remarks. So the communication in science module is taught to first year students that are enrolled within the science access program at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. And these are students that are chosen from disadvantaged backgrounds. So the quick and rapid uh, switch to online learning was even harder on us. It's a module that uses authentic scientific texts such as peer reviewed journal articles and textbooks to teach the scientific genres of report writing, academic essays, uh, tiny mini research projects and oral presentations. And it involves a process approach, which is advocated by Pika and Dixon, where writing is seen as a process rather than a product. It covers various aspects with reading with comprehension of the various texts, questions introduced at various stages and at different uh, Bloom's taxonomy levels. And it involves summary writing, paraphrasing, conceptual mapping, referencing, and academic language, what's suitable, especially within the scientific fields where, where you don't use personal pronouns um, and so forth. So with the arrival of COVID, things were turned upside down quite rapidly. And if you think of physics and forces, this was like no force um, that we've seen. And so there was a loss of control. There were lots of issues going on, on personal levels, professional levels. There was the fear, the isolation, the lifestyle changes that took place overnight, uh, the impact it had on our health and well-being and on those of our students. And then it involved a bit of maths and recalculating, how are we gonna do things differently? How are we gonna make learning more accessible and meaningful and achieve what we used to in a face-to-face -face environment? especially in the terms of a discipline of academic writing, where writing is so important. So it involved, and hopefully where we're moving towards is biology and adaptation, where we are adapting and our students are also adapting to the new way of life. So it was a qualitative, purely qualitative study, and it involved looking at personal reflective journals of two academics 
both teaching this module to first year students. And students are often second language or even third language speakers of English. The data collection period was over March 2020 uh, till September 2021. It also involved documentation and resource analysis, all of the new material that was developed, uploaded on Moodle, as well as the hard copies of notes. Because of our students be, uh, being from disadvantaged backgrounds, we also printed uh, uh, hand, handbooks and gave it to them. So students, when they were able to come to campus, physically collected a copy, but the exact thing was uploaded on Moodle and most students uh, used um, that version. Then in terms of the theoretical framing and the SWOT analysis, it used themes generated from the reflective journals of both the academics and it mapped it onto the SWOT analysis, looking at what could we see coming through in terms of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats. And while those are four different categories, they're not necessarily separate, but rather some feed into each other. So before COVID, everything was structured very well. There was a routine and control, established rules of the game. Um, we had practicals, lectures and tutorials. There were written submitted assessments and there were written tests. And there was a wide range of genres that we could explore. Moving to COVID, there was a whole new game. There was a lot of look-see here, follow trial and error. Uh, we had to not, we, we had to let go of the practicals and, they, and therefore generate data and explain it in a step-by-step -step process to students. Uh, it was a complete transition to online uh, teaching and assessment. And especially because our students are much weaker, there was a lot of hand-holding and a lot of step-by-step, -step, um, whether it was the lectures or the tutorials, a lot of detailed lecture notes, and so the roadmaps speak about how the work is arranged and sequenced in Moodle. So there would be a step one, you would look at this, or when we are looking at this, you would need to then go to two and have a look at these slides or have a look at this video. So it had to be very detailed. Uh, and then it, it made us review our pedagogical practices, moving to online, the new ways of giving feedback in terms of assessment because with our course, there's um, it's academic writing, which is quite intensive, and there's a drafting process where students submit their work, and then they get detailed feedback and have an opportunity to revise uh, that particular piece of work. And that's with the major assessments in terms of the scientific report or the scientific essay. So what came through in terms of the strengths that it was that we needed to develop new uh, skills especially digital skills for, for staff members that had very little or no interaction with online previously. So that involved quite a lot of learning through formal structures in the university uh, of courses that were offered to staff, as well as self-learning. And then it was, how do we make our curriculum different? How do we develop our resources and present them in a, material, in a way that students uh, can grasp and students can in, engage with? And that often involved smaller chunks, providing smaller chunks of particular things, as well as detailed roadmaps, and a lot of, lot of support in terms of documents uploaded, videos, uh, voice uh, activated PowerPoints. Um, there was also the multiple roles where we were learners and students. And in terms of opportunities, there were new ways to, to find out how to teach, uh, working with uh, colleagues, listening to others, developing new ways of assessing, especially because we went from written text and written assignments to everything being on, online and we had to learn quickly how to use Moodle, how to design our quizzes and tests. And uh, it involved uh, a lot of opportunities, but it was also quite a stressful time. So in terms of the weaknesses, there was the loss of control, there was time issues. Uh, and as spoken about earlier, there was the whole 24 seven where we were, felt like we were just working around the clock because we would get emails, constant emails, and lots of them at all times, through the weekends, late at night. Um, and then the big issue of the assessment, the issue of plagiarism, copying, and that was across all disciplines, uh, the, the biology, sci uh, the sciences that the students also do in terms of chemistry and maths and physics. That was an issue uh, that everybody was experiencing. It was also an issue that is well covered in the literature, nationally and internationally, that everybody seems to, um, we are all in the same boat. And then there was the whole issue of working hours and boundaries in terms of the 24 seven, because over time, 
one had to learn to create certain boundaries so that you were not burning yourself out. And some of the threats and <coughs> obstacles were to do with the reduced student engagement. So even though there were uh, Zoom classes, frequent Zoom classes, not a lot of students were attending. They would, as mentioned earlier, when a major assessment was coming about or when we had the feedback sessions. But by and large, we found that students uh, were not engaging or attending the Zoom lectures like they should. And that could be due to an, a large number of reasons, which are also cited in the literature in terms of connectivity, in terms of time management, uh, and those sorts of issues. So when it comes to strength, it's not only coming from what you can do, and I like this quote, it comes from overcoming the things you once thought you couldn't, uh, because overnight we were forced into a whole new world and we were forced to um, adjust, and that has made us stronger going forward. And this is just a quote uh, from one of the academics talking about outer space and the feeling and the comparison with our experience and, and outer space. And at least with outer space, you get time uh, to adapt. Here, this was pretty quick. And so it was, um, as a result, quite stressful. So in terms of the reflective journal, it covered issues of the curriculum, of reflection on a personal level and emotions. And this is just one of the personal um, quotes. So you're looking at strengths and opportunities overlapping. Uh, these were at various levels, as mentioned earlier, from an organizational perspective in terms of staff training and development, uh, in terms of uh, professional teaching experience and curriculum, working with colleagues, collaborations across uh, disciplines. And then on a personal level, in terms of dealing with the multiple roles, becoming the teacher and the learner. And that was simultaneously. So it involved quite a lot. And then there was looking at new ways to teach and developing new ways to assess and then re-looking at feedback because previously with the written assignments, you one would just use a red pen and it was all written on. You didn't have to, the students didn't have to email it to you. You didn't have to open up the document, put your track changes and then re-email them individually to um, 270 students. So there was quite a lot that one had to look at. In terms of opportunities and new ways of teaching, we had to be selective about the genres that were going to be the focus, and that was the scientific reports and scientific essays. So the oral presentations uh, were no longer uh, possible, especially with our large numbers. So we originally had oral presentations that were individual and then went to group, but on the online, uh, for the first and second semester, we have not used the oral um, components. Uh, working in, in, um, in the virtual space, we had to scaffold tasks, and it was a combination of digital literacy alongside with academic literacy. The mock online quizzes, self-paced tests, so not always for assessment. In order to get students uh, accustomed to the feel of things, we actually gave them uh, one of the first assessments, which was not for marks, um, sorry, one of the first tasks, which was not for marks, and when it was working on the scientific essay, they prepared the introductions and each student had the opportunity to email those introductions and get feedback at an individual level, on an individual level, as well as thereafter in a class, um, in a class and a group level. And although there were quite a few students and not all of them used to attend lectures, it was very good to know that quite a, a lot of students actually submitted those, those um, introductions, even though it was not for marks. Um, so there, there was a lot going on where we had to relook at our text, make it more visual. We developed cover co a color coded text to illustrate important arguments in different colors, uh, how they form uh, and how they move with the relationship to the topic or the title of the essay. We also gave them previous samples of essays based on a different topic so that they could have a look at the formatting as well as the content and then they could use that sample to inform their work on their particular topic. The comment boxes in analyzing the text in terms of the do's and don'ts, which covered content, it covered organization in terms of flow, it covered referencing, and then as mentioned earlier, the roadmaps and the sequencing of the Moodle files, the videos, the audio recorded PowerPoint slides. 
So we help students with academic literacy as well as computer literacy skills because a lot of our students have never used MS Word before or Excel to do their graphs and data analysis and also how to teach them to attach their Word documents to emails which they uh, sent to us. So in process writing, it's not a linear process of gathering information, outlining and writing, but it involves many different stages. And as mentioned earlier, one of those stages is the drafting process where students are given the opportunity based on the feedback that we provide for them to revise and edit their work in terms of their assessments. So we were still covering skimming, scanning, highlighting, creating mind maps and annotations, but in a slightly different way. We found ourselves relying more on a visual platform and creating more visual graphics, using color, using images, uh, using YouTube videos. And as mentioned earlier, all of this in smaller chunks. One minute. Okay, so in terms of feedback, we looked at revising various methods of the feedback as mentioned. We used marking grids. Students were clear about what we were doing. Uh, we found that MCQs at first um, were good for short, uh, for short quizzes and stuff, but in the longer run, we needed more um, written work from students. So they submitted written uh, assessments to us. There wasn't a balancing act at looking at feedback in, in terms of not giving too much and not giving too little. So we varied that from semester one to semester two. These are just some of the lessons we learned along the way in terms of our students and their background and ours and how uh, they needed to be on, ongoing uh, reflective practice and creativity. And the last point there, that we needed to collaborate and stay connected for our well-being and mental well-being, as well as for the students. So our concluding remark is that like the, in The Wizard of Oz, we all felt like we were on the yellow brick road searching and we're looking for solutions, we're looking for how we can improve the teaching and learning online, how we can assist students better. And it involved introspection and reflection and it involved sharing and collaboration. So it's a combination of various factors. And one of the most important lessons was that if you, uh, for those of us that are resistant to change, the pandemic forced us to adapt or to be left behind. And this is one of the quotes is uh, from the participants, which just says that I would say it was a space of learning, of adapting and of evolving. Uh, it is a world where in order to survive, you need to learn and not just learn, but learn quickly. Um, thank you, everyone. Distance learning person. <laughs> Virtually impossible. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much, Vanessa. Uh, Dr. Singh, I think uh, beforehand, thank you so much for allowing me to present in, in this session, given the technical difficulties that I had this morning. And it gives me great pleasure to present your colleagues on our topic where uh, my colleague Dominique and, Dominique and myself, were, we are in the process of exploring and evaluating blended learning as a model for legal education and uh, looking at whether it's still going to be relevant for the future for our our law students, given various technological changes, not only in the profession, but also uh, in light of what's commenced with the COVID-19 pandemic globally. So I, I did start this in my earlier session before I was interrupted, so I will just canvas it rather quickly for purposes of time in this presentation. Essentially, uh, before the coronavirus pandemic, our students in law were essentially taught using a traditional blended learning method. In classes, they would do a lot of paper-based work. Uh, the textbook was in physical format, a lot of writing, legal drafting, as they have to learn how to draft certain documents for court. And of course, assessments were all uh, formally done essentially on, on paper with maybe the odd sort of quiz or multiple choice type questions that would be done via a learning management system. So there would be some electronic learning elements. But since the onset of the coronavirus pandemic globally, we've had to shift our learning particularly onto the online space and following an online pedagogical mode of delivery. Uh, and especially taking into account the tenets and trends of the fourth industrial revolution. This paper that we are currently working on is still under construction and really the focus of my presentation with you today is more sort of on the contextual 
um, elements that we've found, especially over the past uh, year since 2020 and looking at this year, uh, and especially looking at some of the challenges that our students and our lecturers have had to undergo in the process. So um, the blended learning model was essentially impacted given the nature of the government re regulations and the various alert level lockdowns that have been experienced in the country. Face-to-face -face learning has either been or was either uh, fully prohibited or as of late, it's been restricted, uh, for example, with regard to social distancing, only a certain number of students and staff are allowed on campuses. Uh, so it's been restricted in that way. And a lot of the learning then has had to take place from home via electronic media. Uh, there have been new measures for students and lecturers to be followed. Um, so they've, on our side, we've had to look at new ways of supporting lecturers and students uh, in the electronic space, uh, because especially in our space with our lecturers, they are not only academic, but they are also legal practitioners. They themselves are attorneys and advocates working in the profession, and they uh, have not had as much exposure to learning in the online environment or teaching in the online environment as well. So we've had to implement things like training workshops and various touch base calls via various call platforms to hear how they are doing, where do they need support, where do they need help, and this has been an ongoing process uh, over the past year and a half or so. Uh, what we've also noticed, especially in the context of our students, is that access to online learning and it, I've, I've various of our colleagues today have presented on this issue as well. There's been a socioeconomic challenge being faced by our students relating to their affordable, affordability of Wi-Fi, also been geographical challenges and load shedding. Uh, geographical challenges in the sense that for a lot of our students, especially the students who stay, for example, in rural areas, uh, they haven't been able to, for example, get easy access to Wi-Fi or data. Uh, the only place they could essentially do it was on campus. So not being able to go to campus because of lockdown regulations for them was rather difficult. And there's also been psychological and emotional impact on everyone. Uh, the coronavirus com pandemic has affected all of us. Uh, in very different and very um, severe ways in terms of degree, I should rather say. Uh, we've uh, been exposed to what I call here digital isolation. It was a concept that I learned when I had still I had read for a journalism degree before I went into study law. And it was a concept that I learned back then in the early 2000s, speaking to how people can sometimes feel alone in the digital space without some type of human interaction and we've detected that with our students as well and that's also something we've had to learn now to try and manage. So if we're looking at online versus blended learning we've had to look at how online learning without the blended element um, has had to be considered in order to enhance legal education and we've had to ask is the traditional blended learning method working still for our legal practitioners and even if we look into the future and some of the future developments not only for law students but also for the profession are points that I would like to touch on a little later in this presentation just to give you an idea. What we have to do is we have to assess this in the context of examining what is different about the learning experience and legal education if it is going to go fully, on, fully online versus a blended face-to-face -face online uh, learning methodology. Um, so in looking at that, what I need to turn to as a lens is how we actually teach in, in the law and in the various disciplines. And in order to do this, I would just like to share the following quote uh, with you. It's taken from the 1973 film, uh, The Paper Chase. Uh, and I think in the interests of time, I'm not really going to read the quote. I have it there for you to look at, but I just want to touch on some central aspects of, the, of this particular quotation, dealing particularly with the Socratic method. So being able to ask our students questions and getting them to be able to answer. And it, particularly in law, uh, the quotation makes reference to, if you see at the end there, you come in here with a skull full of mush and you leave thinking like a lawyer. In our case, uh, for those of you who have watched the legal sitcoms like uh, Suits, Law and Order, The Good Wife, uh, the law is perceived to be very, if you're working in the law, it's very glamorous, you wear very nice clothes, you go to court and court is supposed to be very glamorous and this is often the uh, supposition that our students come into studying law with and um, 
being able to teach them the law in this regard and being able to get them to think is not just about delivering a lecture straight off the textbook, but it's about also getting them to think about how would they act in the law as legal pr practitioners? What are the ethical considerations? What are the various fields of law that they can, that they can work in? And we teach this by following a Socratic method, by getting them to answer questions, to think about the questions, and especially with argument. If we say to them, adopt an opinion, then we ask them to adopt the opinion, but they must give us ri uh, reasons why they agree or disagree on a particular issue, because as lawyers, they've got to be able to develop that argumentative skill and that ability to think. And this has been rather easy to do in the traditional blended learning uh, manner. So for example, with us, we use Blackboard as a learning management system. So they would use their, their textbook and their study guide or their module outlines to understand what is being covered in a particular learning unit in a particular week. And then we would also get them to engage with the various learning questions that they, that they would encounter online on Blackboard that are specifically set for them to actually help them tease out those very um, central concepts to their course and to their material. Uh, so this is essentially what, what we are looking at and what uh, Dominique and I have been asking is the question of how will this, will this work? Will this work entirely for us in the on-learning beg your pardon, on the online learning space for our students to really just work in the electronic and digital domain without a, a human face-to-face -face interaction to perhaps assist them with uh, developing their own thoughts and their own answers to the questions that they are, they are asked. So I wanted to speak to, in light of the Socratic method, and how we look to teach our students in law, I want to speak to some of the disruptive factors that have entered legal education, especially within the past um, five or so years. Uh, at the moment with our uh, LLB program, our Bachelor of Laws program, we are currently recurriculating our LLB program for rollout next year. And we are recurriculating it, keeping in mind the South African Council for Higher Education's um, report on the state of the Bachelor of Laws qualification in South Africa. And there are four central tenets of this uh, particular report that we are focusing on. And, and over the past year, we've had great pleasure in remodifying and restructuring our modules on our current LLB program. And we are looking forward to recurriculating our current modules in our program now with these four tenets in mind. So essentially the responsiveness to globalization, responsiveness to ever evolving information technology, which is critical in light of what has been presented before in this con conference and what lies ahead for uh, all of us to consider in the edu educational realm. Uh, transformative constitutionalism and responsiveness to social justice. Transformative constitutionalism and responsiveness to social justice in light of our particular legal context asks us the question of how are we structuring our qualifications in law to include thoughts of, of our constitution, the values of our constitution, the essence and the principles of our constitution and human rights, uh, not only in the local domain, but also in the international domain worldwide. Uh, and it, it's asking the question of how are we starting to transform our legal profession and our society as a whole to actually embody what our constitution has in terms of its values and in terms of a society that is democratic based on values such as freedom, equality, and dignity. And these are uh, values and principles that we have to now inculcate into all of our modules and into our qualifications, as well as the responsiveness to social justice, which is asking the question of how do we help those in the community who are not able to help themselves? And how are we in our qualification developing a sense of community, engaging with the community? And it's not so much talking about just doing social outreach projects or um, going into communities and offering legal advice, there is a lot more at stake. And this is what we've also had to consider when we are now looking at how will this look in the, on, in the online space, because especially transformative constitutionalism and the responsiveness to social justice are very human 
in nature and they require a very human element in dealing with people in person as opposed to trying to deal with people online. So these are all factors that we've all looking to consider and we're doing uh, further research on. Other disruptive changes in legal education that we are looking at for further study is the move to online assessment, which from previous presenters that I've listened to today, I think we there's a lot that I've learned and a lot still to be, to be learned in this area. Um, the challenges we've encountered in the online education space, um, are still very much socioeconomic. Uh, for example, with our students, they usually get at least uh, 21 hours to submit an assessment, uh, catering for things like load shedding, disruptions in connectivity, as what happened to me earlier in my um, session, uh, to being able to access Wi-Fi and or data in order to complete the assessment and submit. Other challenges that we've encountered that uh, have always been there, I would say, pre-COVID-19, but they're more amplified now in the electronic space are plagiarism and contract cheating, which we are also exploring, looking to see how we can root out and to address. Um, lecturer marking loads have also increased because in the online space, we've noticed that, for example, students sometimes will write more than what is required in an answer in order to try and address everything that they think needs to be addressed by a question. So we've had to look at, for example, things like page limits, word count limits, uh, in order to try and limit that. But the lecturer's marking loads are still relatively high and they have required in immense support in that regard from us to try and help them manage the marking loads. Lecturer-student interaction to some degree has been limited as of uh, late in terms of looking at blended learning. Lect uh, lecturers and students have had very limited face-to-face -face interaction. A lot of that has been taking place online and there are lecturers have needed support as well of our students. And especially as to how we set questions and how assessments are to be structured. And particularly in law, if we look at our national qualification uh, framework level descriptors, looking at NQF levels five, two, five six, seven, and eight, uh, we've really had to take into consideration how these would be examined in a sit-down uh, situation, if you will, and how they're going to be examined in take-home in situations. And it's a very thin line for us that we found that we've had to tread because in law, for example, we can rely extensively on case studies, on court cases, on legislation, uh, asking students to read journal articles, to read um, media pieces or media releases, for example, from the Constitutional Court. But where we experience some difficulty with this is especially for students at an introductory level, we tread a very fine line between trying to make it still uh, basic and trying to get them to derive a basic educational benefit from the assessment to learn and not making the questions, for example, too difficult or too complex. So this is also an area where we are learning a, a great deal uh, day by day. One of the presenters uh, in one of the earlier sessions attended, uh, that I attended uh, said that it's a case of look and see and trial and error. And I think for all of us, this is pretty much where we are at and it gives us a chance to improve and to re review as we are going forward. But these are just some of the other areas, particularly in, in legal education, that we want to examine further for educating our students um, in the various levels that they are, are engaged in study. Five minutes. Other disruptive changes that we are looking at for further study uh, concern the practical components for law students. Uh, in particular, what we do with our students in some of our modules, especially in some of our court practice modules that we have, is that they engage in a so-called moot court or mock trial. Essentially, what the students will do here is they will um, be given a hypothetical set of facts, which can uh, pretty much relate to a, an, another area of law that they're studying. It can be in family law, it can be, for example, a divorce matter, it can be a motor vehicle collision. And the students have to go and read up and research and construct an argument uh, based on whichever party in those facts they've, if one group is representing A, the other group represents B, they draft their arguments that way. And that has always taken part in a physical 
um, setting, but now with the COVID-19 pandemic, we haven't been able to, to do that. And last year, we had a couple of complications. But uh, what we did pick up was that towards the end of last year, one of our campuses ran, an, ran a digital moot court for their students in one of our modules, and it had favorable results. Some of the challenges we found, for example, were internet connectivity, um, the timing and the actual assessment of court dress code and court etiquette were some of the issues that we had. So, for example, I've heard, uh, we heard some uh, stories of, for example, students who were dressed for business at, at the top, if you will, and they were dressed for holidays at the bottom. And uh, so these kinds of issues are of, of, of something that we've also had to learn about and how it's actually supposed to be conducted in, in that space. Some of the South African developments in the legal profession itself involve a project called Case Lines, which is an on online document and evidence submission system that was implemented in the high courts of South Africa, particularly in Johannesburg and Pretoria in 2020. And it's really only for civil matters, for criminal matters, it has not been implemented as yet. And uh, there's also the aspect of court proceedings taking place online. So the admission of attorneys and advocates has been taking place online where the judges are also joining online with the candidates also joining online and that's how they are being admitted and previously it used to be done in court and there are aspects of technological development in this regard that we've had to think about taking taking it out of the blending learning space into the online online domain by implementing it in some of our law modules like the law of evidence uh, in cyber law and in some of our court practice modules and this is something that is constantly developing as well. Some aspects that we are looking at for further research into this area and with regard to this paper, what I'm hoping will be sort of a branching off for, for us into different domains is we are looking to survey the, the experiences of lecturers and students in this in this area. We've, uh, we've going to look into it almost as it's longitudinal, maybe over 2020 and 2021 to compare monitoring further technological developments in the legal profession because there are still online, uh, online developments that are occurring, uh, perceptions of moving into the online space for, for legal practitioners is also something that we would like to do is to inquire with legal practitioners about what has the experience been for them uh, in that in being able to appear in court online, how has it been for them and uh, we're of the view that there's still a place for blended learning in legal education, but the trajectory of at the moment with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is, is that if alert levels change sometimes at a moment's notice, obviously it's going to be severely affected and the move will probably have to be to full online and e-learning. Uh, so looking at ideas of leadership and how this must be, how these changes must be managed to tertiary institutions, using an LMS for more interactive and innovative instructional design as, as teaching and learning and legal education is also something we want to explore. Instead of an LMS being used as a Dropbox for lecturers, lecturer slides, uh, we want to look at how those can be used more effectively. Looking at OER for legal education and access to alternative and creative resources for our students, along with ebooks and other textbooks, and new ways of curbing plagiarism and offsite cheating or contract cheating is also what we look to explore. I think, with the little bit of time that I've got, I think just to conclude and just to say, colleagues, we see blended learning education still having a place in the law, still having a human face for our students to, to engage with and for some pretty much someone that they can ask who uh, is, is there to help them, who can understand them and who's built a rapport with them. But uh, in time, I think with the online developments that we are looking at in the legal profession, we also have to consider how our students will uh, be able to, to develop and how we can as legal educators uh, help them to embark more on being prepared for a technologically advanced profession. As, as time goes along. Uh, thank you very much, colleagues. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening and, and accommodating. I look forward to more discussion and questions on this. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, colleagues. And thank you very much, Dr. Singh and Professor Nair for organizing this and being so alert on emails in the middle of the night and early morning, whenever. It's really appreciated. Okay, my, my, well, this talk is, is a typical mundane academic kind of thing. 
it's not as flashy as uh, the talk we saw, I think the second talk this morning, for example, or the keynote. But anyway, um, the two authors on, on this paper is myself. Uh, I'm currently with the Graduate School of Business Leadership, which is essentially a business school in Matran and Genisa. And my colleague, uh, Cyril Dagmar, Dr. Cyril Dagmar from School of Computing, where I used to be for 25 years before I moved to the SBL. All right, so um, let me just see that I can move on with this now. Come on, where's my cursor now? No, it doesn't want to move on. Okay, there you we can go. use it. Okay. Yeah, okay, I've got it. Now, just I've got a new computer and the buttons. It seemed to me it was sort of refurbished or rebuilt, but it looks new, but on the inside it isn't. All right, so, so the, the, the agenda is the introduction. Uh, research questions and objective I will look at, research methodology, specification styles, um, abstract specifications, procedural specifications, and then open distance e-learning aspects. Then Moodle very, very briefly, I'm hoping my colleague, Dr. Skuman, who comes after me, will say more about Moodle. Mar Marty, if you don't, then apologies. Then, uh, because this is a problematization, trying to look at what are the problems involved in the online teaching of formal methods. Then we would like to like a look at the problematization framework and conclusions and future work. Okay, right, introduction. Uh, apologies for moving this cursor around, but if then it disappears and I can't move to the next screen. All right, um, the, the teaching of formal methods, which involves essentially discrete mathematics and logic, is sort of mandated by our ACM IEEE. If you look at those straw man, iron man things, which I would like to call straw person, straw uh, or iron person, um, they, they tell you that these are essential things that what should have in a curriculum. Because it's mathematics and it's logic, there's, there's a steep learning curve involved. And so the online teaching, as we've seen many uh, times today, very often, is that this, this compromises it, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult. And I think physics and chemistry, mathematics, they have similar problems. Okay, so the research questions, we essentially have two. Um, we would like to take a look at what are the notational complexities with respect to these things, formal methods in software engineering, and what challenges do formal methods teaching pose to Odell uh, and underlining learning management systems, for example, Moodle. Blackboard, Clarolina, any of those. And the objective is to develop a problematization framework to elicit these challenges. Now, remember, we're not going to give solutions. This is just pointing out problems. We're doing like journalists, we just point out problems. Come on, cursor. Okay. Okay, the research methodology I'm essentially using um, Saunders et al.'s research onion. And uh, there is the reference, if you can see there. And let's just run through the layers quickly. From the outside, our philosophy is positivist because of the use of formal methods. It's also interpretive. Uh, you interpret qualitative text in the literature. All right. Words and diagrams and things like that. At the next level, our approach is inductive because you build the framework. It's also brief deductive because you validate the framework theoretically. Then the choice is monoqualitative. We analyze text again. And because there's mathematics involved, I like to call this a pseudo quantitative. It's not statistics, but it is mathematics, symbols and things like that. Strategy simply was literature review, specifications at this stage, the cross-sectional time horizon. In future, it might become longitudinal as this thing goes on and on. And um, techniques and procedures, again, at this stage, just to take a collection from the literature. Later, we will be hoping to do surveys among practitioners, lecturers, and so on. Okay, now here is the specification style. Here is something, this is the part where it turns rather mundane, I think. Um, the abstract specification using the Z specification language. You define a state space, and you define an operation on the state. Now, what is interesting here, that thing is called a partial uh, function, uh, or partial injective function. And this is the idea is, is for a soccer system where hooligans are banned from <laughs> attending matches. And so if a person is banned, then the person can't just go and reapply under another ID. So a member can have at most ID. 
So the, the function is injected. Okay, and that's one of the value of these things. Okay, here's something that might be way more familiar to you. Statements with sequence, sequences, if then else, and then while loops and so forth. Now in the terminology of formal methods, we talk about a or triple coming from car or a precondition, some statement or a program, and a post condition. Now, because P and post condition and precondition both start with the letter P, we decided to use a Q as the post condition because it comes after Q, uh, sorry, after P. All right, so we have there a sequence of statements, three assignments, an if and an else, and we've got a while loop. And then you can ask students all kinds of questions. What does the program do? And what is the loop invariant? In other words, what is the thing that stays the same throughout the execution of the loop? And by the way, that is the answer. So as you can see, it's not that simple, as you well know if you've programmed before. Okay, so um, to, if you have a post condition, to come to the precondition, you simply substitute the right hand side of the statement into the post condition and you solve for the thing on the left. And then you get the precondition. Now, this is a pretty mechanical rule. Um, and I don't know how many of you know uh, Professor Carol Morgan. Uh, I met him at Wofax 1998. Yeah, it gives away my age, by the way. And he says, this is mechanical. It's something you mustn't think you just do. All right, so this is the first important thing. Then when the if, else, if, else, if, else statements, there's a lot of parallel thinking along the two branches when you try and validate or when you try and verify things. And the while statement gives even more problems. You have to, you have to successively pretty much like in recursion, you have to build up successive environments and then unpop them again. So you build up a environment zero or one or two and so you go on until the loop finishes and then you work back in reverse. Now, obviously this is an algorithm, so it's, it's ideal for automation. Sorry, let me just go back. It's ideal for, for automation, but you know, students mustn't just automate things, they must learn actually how to do it. And we found that this is giving them the most problems. Okay, so briefly about Moodle, I won't say much about Moodle, what I've heard from it, it's a pretty um, sophisticated environment. It's adaptable. You can change it online. And our university standardized on it only at the beginning of 2021. So there are lots of issues with it. I have seen in the school where I used to be, there have been workshops asked for it, and then it was canceled. And people say the manual is not very good and so on. So yeah, um, like in everything, there are teething problems. And I've seen in the literature, most university courses have decided to augment it or even write their own environment. So with respect to formal methods, we need specialized tools with Moodle, proof table generators, type checkers, reasoners, theorem proofs, and all those things. Okay, briefly about problematization, um, creating a problem from something. Some people always make problems from things, but there's actually, there's actually a science behind this. It comes from early work by French philosophers, that person, Kuhn and Morgan. And it's uh, the essential idea is you unpack, you unpack the challenges first before you jump to a solution. I don't know how many of you know Michael Jackson's problem frame idea, but that's the same. You, um, you have solutions for everything and you've got frames and you fit them onto the, onto the problems. So, oh yes, yeah, so yeah, this frame fits onto this problem. What is the solution for this frame? I already have it, and there it goes. Okay, so um, some interesting work with respect to problematization that we've seen is there were two people, Locke and Golden, Golden Biddle. They problematized literature, where they looked at 82 publications from a certain time, over 20 years. They didn't take 20 years. The publications were over 20 years. And they saw three kinds of things in these publications, incompleteness, where the research uh, says this work is not finished. Inadequacy, it says it doesn't sufficiently incorporate different viewpoints. And this one is real problematic. Inconsumerability says that what has been done is blatantly wrong. Our model of the atom is wrong. It's not how it works. Okay. And this is really the good thing. Um, we'll be giving a talk tomorrow on the Odell challenges of uh, supervision in computing. And this is specifically the thing. The styles that were thought in the past were correct would turn out to be incorrect. And we see that in politics, we see that in gender studies all along, inconsumerability. 
Okay, so all these things we believe can be used in our problematization framework. And here is another one from Morgan from 1980. At the top he says there are paradigms. That's where the people who really make decisions sit. Here lower down are the managers, the metaphors, schools of thought. And down here are the things that we usually do. The puzzle solving, writing programs, doing this, doing that. Okay. If you just have a brief discussion about it, um, a paradigm looks at an alternative to the norm, the so-called alternative realities. And here you say, should we have, for example, online or should we, should we have something else? In the formal methods arena, should we view software as a mathematical object? Some people swear by this. They say, yes, this is what it is. And other people swear at it. They know this is not how it works. Okay, so that is a paradigm. Then in the metaphor, you decide, suppose we decide formal methods, then are we gonna look at static algebraic things? Are we gonna look at dynamic model-based things? And here at the puzzle solving, suppose you pick the algebraic, what are you gonna teach about it? Actions and state spaces and things like that, okay. Okay, uh, our problematization framework that we came up with is in the form of a table, it's on three slides because it's so big, we identified a lot of aspects and uh, considerations, and each one has got a couple of components. I highlighted some things in red, the three levels of Morgan. Notational complexities are always the big problem that we found with these things. And the more complex it is, the harder it is to teach online. Hidden information, some things are hidden in software. Software is invisible, and that's why it's so difficult to work with it. And while loops is a typical example. Diverse application. Now, this one interests me a lot. All the work that I've seen on program verification take numeric examples. But what about more qualitative things? Management, strategy, leadership. How do you quantify that? I attended the talk by Professor Dan Remenye two days ago, where he said to me, no, my young man, <laughs> this cannot be quantified. This is not, it, it will never be able to be done. Now, I don't necessarily agree with it. Um, but still, these sort of things are going to be problems. So it's part of our problematization framework. Odell aspects, there are a lot, but environments, I think, is the one to look at. The last one about the table, the objections, people say it's only for toy problems, but it can be scaled. All right. Cognitive aspects, and there you see them again. So many of the things appear in more than one category in the table. Okay, I'm almost done. Uh, summary conclusions on future work. What have we now done? Well, we presented some specification complexities. We looked at the abstract one, the Z boxes, the procedural one, which you know very well. We touched on these words, note the word touched on Adele aspects, Moodle considerations. And then we looked at problematization culminating in a problematization framework. So just remember the framework is just the problems. It is not, let me just go back, sorry about that. It's just the problems, it doesn't give solutions yet. So the future work, we will have to validate this framework. Maybe instead of a, a table, a three column table, we would have to make it a diagram that is, that is more expressive and easier to read. And then we will have to embark on surveys to see are there any missing things. And then hopefully we can develop a solution framework from this. And that's what I have for you, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you very much. Okay, as you heard, I'm Matis Kuman from School of Computing at UNISA. So what I'm doing with this, I'm exploring how to infuse certain aspects of graduateness in an introductory programming module. And of course, UNISA is ODL. Um, overview of what I will be talking about. First, in the introduction, I will explore the concept of graduateness. And then related work, I will um, discuss work that relates to what I'm doing, the background about the module, the measures that I've implemented, and my reflection on the effect thereof, and then the conclusion and future research. Okay, as I've said, the aim of the research is um, an attempt to infuse certain aspects of graduateness in an introductory programming module. As Dr. Sukon said, the idea is to develop independent learners, but not isolated learners. 
graduateness, um, the definition of graduateness varies amongst different institutions and also between higher education institutions and professional and regulatory bodies. In general, graduateness is seen as the attributes, the knowledge and the skills students need for gainful employment. This will include both cognitive and non-cognitive skills. In other words, they need to have subject specific and discipline knowledge, but also non-cognitive skills such as social and emotional skills. And that is not necessarily part of university curricula. The 21st century skills provide a broad definition of graduateness. And if you want to know more about that, you can look at the paper. What research has shown is that employers value soft skills more than the cognitive skills. They are in particularly interested in students being able to have the skill of self-management and lifelong learning. Lifelong learning, especially in the IT environment. Self-management refers to the ability to work independently, to manage your own time, your own work, objectives, resources, and career. Bitzer and Withering's 2020 research indicate that there's a lack of research in graduate attributes in higher education in South Africa. Um, I'll not go into the reasons why that is the case. It's not easy. He also, they also found that it's not easy to teach soft skills. And an important aspect of this is that students need to accept responsibility for their own learning and for developing their, their soft skills. Now, in the ODL environment, it's a little bit, I think, more difficult than in a face-to-face -face environment because the lecturer, it's far more difficult for the lecturer to um, influence students because there's the transactional distance, there's the time difference, the space difference, economic difference, social, educational, epistemological, and communicational di distance. And then all the material are digital. Students are not always, well, very good at using digital material. What can be done to alleviate transactional distance is to create a supportive and caring environment that will create a sense of community and effective proximity and will develop in students positive attitudes and pro-social behavior and also develop their social emotional skills. In this regard, the lecturer's social presence play an important role because that encouraged student engagement and also assist in creating a sense of community, which then in turn improves academic performance. Unfortunately, computing students are some of the most reluctant students to engage. I guess it's the nerd in us. Related work that has been done to what I do is attempts to develop soft skills, which are mostly aimed at final year students. For instance, problem-based learning, work integrated learning, project-based learning, apprenticeships, collaborative learning, and capstone projects. But for all of them, students need to be more than a first year. They need to have some basic knowledge that they can apply in the work environment. Student reflection, on the other hand, in the form of effective writing, is something that can be applied at any level, first year level, second, third, post-grad level. What student reflection or reflective writing does, it develops students' critical thinking, analytical and problem-solving skills, also their self-awareness, grit and self-confidence, and it also supports intra- and interpersonal skills. The background to the context in which I'm doing the work is an introductory programming module, and it's an ODL environment, as UNISA is. I started last year in 2020, then the, the module was still a semester module with between 600 and 700 students per semester. This year it has been um, transformed into a year module and I have 1,600 plus students. I think 1,656 to be um, absolute. Problems in this module. There's a lack of engagement from students. They don't engage with the lecturer. They are reluctant to engage with e-tutors and with their fellow students. Many of them are not submitting all their assignments and they frequently start too late on doing the assignments. And then a nasty one, assignments are offered for sale on the internet. That's not, yeah, 
that's a nasty problem. Um, just continue. I implemented some measures to try to alleviate the situation to encourage the students to take responsibility for their own learning. So I started with sending them weekly email announcements. And in this weekly email announcement, I provide the assignment questions gradually. In the weekly email announcement, they will see, for instance, this week you have to study chapter three and you have to do this and these activities. And here are the assignment questions based on the work in chapter three. So they don't get the full assignment. Um, and then the assignment, hopefully, cannot be purchased on the internet. Then I incorporate student reflection. I'll say more about that later. I joined the students WhatsApp group and I created a Microsoft team for my course. The weekly email announcements, typically we use email announcements to, um, to alert students to urgent matters, for instance, to alert them to the due date that has changed or to the fact that the um, exam is coming up or whatever. My aim with the weekly email announcements was to help the students to stay on track with the study program. They provided with the study program that set out week by week. This week you have to study this, you've got to do this activity. And in the weekly email then, I also provide additional notes based on the work for that week. I encourage the students by telling them it's okay to struggle, you have to struggle, you have to engage with the material, otherwise you will not manage mastery. I inform them about assistance provided by the university, for instance, the first year experience MOOC and orientation programs. And then there are also guidance related to the module, for instance, how to plan a program, what to do when you get stuck debugging a program, and then the material to foster graduateness. The material to foster graduateness are all um, taken from published material. It's from books or from um, blogs, things for, uh, published on the internet. I just give a snippet or a summary about certain aspects or material that I think would be relevant to the student. And I start off with Cal Newport. He's a professor at a computer science professor at um, Georgetown University in Washington. With his definition of deep work, which is also the title of his book, deep work is professional activities performed in a state of distraction free concentration that push your cognitive abilities to their limit. These efforts create new value, improve your skill, and are hard to replicate. This is exactly what you are trying to do when you learn to program. So I explain to them why does it matter and tell them about the flow, which is a reward in itself, how to eliminate distractions to improve their focus and how attention shapes quality of life. Tell them about deliberate practice, um, Bloom's taxonomy. Why Bloom's taxonomy? Because in order to be able to program, you need to at least, you must know you must, that first level, you must understand a statement um, and only then are you able to apply it and you even have to synthesize different statements in order to, pro pro um, to create a working program. Students are also told about or informed about learning strategies such as the spacing effect and retrieval practice. Tell your grandmother what you've learned, explain to her and avoid overconfidence. If you think that you understand something, you most probably have not mastered it. They're told about 21st century skills to give them an idea of what to expect, what will be expected of them in the working place. They're also introduced to computational thinking and to the auto thinking app, which helps to develop the computational thinking. It's a game similar to Pac-Man. And then they're asked to reflect. Initially, at the start of the module, I asked them, why are they studying this module? What skills and knowledge do they expect to gain from this that will help them in their working environment, in their career? They're also told about reflection as a way to study more effectively and, and um, told, given a link to a field experiment where the control group were just told, you're writing a test next week. The experimental group were also told you're writing a test next week. 
what questions do you expect to be asked? How can you prepare for these questions? And they're also introduced on or given material on how to reflect. And then there's a question in each assignment. The last question of each assignment is reflect on your experience of doing the assignment. What would you do different? Um, now that you've done it, what do you wish you had known before? things like that. When were you at your best? When were you most creative? Before the exam, they asked to reflect on the mark they expect in the exam, what questions, what gaps they have, what can they do to prepare for it. And then they have to reflect on the exam. And that's the reflection on the exam itself. After the exam, I asked them for feedback on the module to see, well, just what they think of the module and for me to change what needs to be changed. Um, sorry. There. Now, my own reflection, my initial motivation was simply to improve the pass rate. And then COVID entered the arena. That means I cannot compare the pass rates from the previous years to the pass rate for last year because all the exams had to be moved online. Circumstances were completely different for students and for the lecturers. Another effect of COVID was the, the fact that the external markers contracts couldn't be signed because it's paper based and no one was allowed on campus. That meant I had to mark all the assignments and student reflections. Marking the student reflections was a remarkable experience. It gave me insight into students' lived experience. They would tell me how difficult it is to work while you you work, you study, you've got children, some of them have got disabled children, they've got elderly parents living with them. Where do I find the time? And then themes that came out prominently was how difficult it is to plan a program, time management and consistent study. Also the value of planning a program instead of just sitting in front of your computer and trying to write the program. These are things that came out consistently. And it was also things that I tried to um, bring over in the weekly announcements. The weekly assignment questions, in, to my mind, definitely had a positive effect on completion. More students completed um, the assignments and they also engaged more. They engaged more with each other as well as with me. Teams especially played a big role here because it's so easy um, in teams to put a question in the chat. For me, it pops up on the screen and I can, if it's possible, I can quickly answer. Otherwise, um, take a little bit more time. Um, all of this created a supportive environment to the students or at least the student experience the environment in which they were doing this model as supportive. Here's some evidence. Um, I received many of them that said they appreciate it, they would like to study other modules like this and which other modules will I be teaching? But they were also felt free to tell me, for instance, the last one, how depressing it is to hear how far behind I am. So yeah, both positive and negative feedback. On the exam, um, the, the first semester was online multiple choice questions and that produced a really unrealistic high marks for students. So the second semester I changed it to a combination of online multiple choice questions and short answer questions. Short answer questions were code snippets um, and the code snippets were like a section that they, for instance, for a class, they would do the class definition and another implementation for another class and application for another class. And it just showed me how difficult it is for novices to understand the concepts and to apply it. Students, as I've said before, were asked to reflect before the exam on the mark expected, the questions they expected, the gaps in their knowledge and what they can do. I received a number of queries after the exam about their marks. And interestingly, these were the students who had distinctions, who asked, why did they not get a better mark? Which tells me 
they did reflect on their mark expected and the, what was expect, will be expected in the exam of them. So overall, there were more engagement also regarding the exam. It could be because it was um, because it was done in different circumstances, but it could also be that students take more responsibility for their learning. Another interesting fact was that for the June exam, students had the opportunity to defer their exam to November because at that stage, we still hoped it would be um, an ordinary exam where they would be able to write on paper. Um, and remarkably, there was actually not many of them who chose to do so. The level of exam absence was constant in comparison to other years. Um, yes, the evidence, the feedback I received are subjective, but to me it's positive. It really provided me with a unique perspective on student experience and I found it personally rewarding. Um, distance education can be very unpersonal, um, both for students and for staff. It emphasized the value of student reflection, a caring environment, and the lecturer's social presence to me. And it definitely shows me that a formal study on what I've done here is justified. This could include a qualitative study on student experiences and also a longitudinal study on students will reflect. Um, any questions? I'm going to stop sharing because I can't see anything. <laughs>